All right, well, welcome to the show. Former President Donald Trump booed for doing the right thing, getting his COVID-19 booster vaccine. Bill O'Reilly was on stage with him and asked the question. He'll join us live to talk about it. But first, closing arguments today in the trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter. The fate of the 49-year-old now in the hands of the jury who have just finished their first day of deliberations. Potter shot and killed 20-year-old Dante Wright in April after seemingly mistaking her handgun for a taser. Wright was pulled over for an expired tag, but then when officers realized he had an outstanding warrant for a weapons violation, they tried to arrest him. He resists, appears to try to drive away. Here's the moment of the shooting and Potter's reaction that has been critical in the trial. During closing arguments today, the prosecution and defense painting that scene into two totally different realities. The prosecution saying she was criminally negligent and reckless. In this case, the defendant made choices, a number of choices, and those choices killed Dante Wright. She chose to engage. She chose to use force. She chose to escalate. She chose to draw the weapon on the right side of her duty belt. She chose to reach her right hand down to her holster. She chose to ignore the feel of that holster. She chose to ignore the weapon in her hand and how it came out of the holster. She chose to put her finger on the trigger. She chose to ignore the feel of the trigger. She chose to ignore the feel of the grip. She chose to ignore the weight. She chose to ignore the color. She chose to pull the trigger. She chose to fire. She chose to disregard her training and to disregard the cautions and the warnings and the risks. But this case is also not about the defendant's law abiding or peaceful nature that you heard about. It's about what she did on that day on April 11th. It's about her rash and reckless conduct. You heard from a number of people that she's a good person or a good cop. You heard from a lot of people in her police family. Members of the jury, good people can commit crimes. Meanwhile, the defense making two key arguments, that she had the right to use deadly force, and even if she didn't, that this was not a crime, but instead a deadly accident. But you have to look at the law and the evidence, the evidence about did she have a right to use deadly force? Of course she did, whether she knew it or not. All those officers said that. She didn't know she had a gun, so how could she consciously, recklessly handle one? And more, above all, in the first one, causation. Everything they were doing as good police officers until Dante Wright took it upon himself to flee. He even left after he was shot. Purposely. Everybody makes mistakes. And some of those mistakes are small mistakes, but some of them are very serious. And she obviously made a mistake. She it's called an action error. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect, ladies and gentlemen. And this lady here made a mistake. And my gosh, a mistake is not a crime. It just isn't. This coming on the heels of Friday when Kim Potter took the stand in her own defense. We were struggling. We were trying to keep him from driving away. It just, it just went chaotic. I, it, and then I 
remember yelling, taser, 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 and nothing happened. And then he told me I shot him. She broke down in tears multiple times, including when the prosecution pressed her on what she did and didn't do that day. You didn't plan to use deadly force that day, did you? <laughs> no. Because you knew that deadly force was unreasonable and unwarranted in those circumstances. And I didn't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> now today, the jurors who started deliberating asked a question that might tell us something about where they are in deliberations. They asked about the date that Kim Potter spoke to a guy named Dr. Lawrence Miller, a psychologist called by the defense as a witness. The judge responding, all the evidence is in, the jury should rely on the evidence. But here's what Dr. Miller said on the stand last week when talking about Kim Potter and her thought process during the shooting. An action error is a sequence of responses in which an intended action has an unintended effect. This has, does not have to do with outside interference willful neglect or, um, you know, conscious manipulation. You intend to do one thing, think you're doing that thing, but do something else and only realize later that um, the action that you intended was not the one you took. So very interesting that the jurors asked um, about the timing of when she had spoken to that witness when he interviewed her, etc. My take on this case I don't think legally she can justify deadly force based on the circumstances, but she could justify use of non-deadly force or a taser, which she clearly meant to use. I think the defense is going too far in claiming the shooting itself was justified. But also maybe the prosecution's going too far in arguing that she specifically chose to ignore this, the, the sound we heard before, she chose this, she chose that. And also the prosecution essentially arguing that Dante Wright's actions are irrelevant. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with a former cop who could have used non-lethal force, but made a mistake. The question is whether it's a criminally negligent or reckless mistake. Now, if this was a civil trial for money damages, I think she'd probably be found liable. But in a criminal case with a higher standard, with the possibility of years in prison on the table, I'm not so sure. I think you could see a hung jury here. Joining us now, attorney Jesse Weber, anchor for the Law and Crime Network, and Julius Kim, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. Before I ask you both about what you think this question from the jury means, Julius, the case is over. The evidence is in. You've heard the closing arguments. Where do you think the case sits right now? All right, seems we well, can't hear you. Opening remarks. Oh. We have people that are... Um, uh, we have people, we have good arguments on both sides is what it comes down to, Dan. We have arguments from the defense that this was an accident that uh, occurred I, from. Right. I'm, but I'm asking you, right. I'm not, I, I, I just laid out the arguments. I'm asking you, what do you make of where we are in the case today? What would you predict the jury is thinking, doing? How close a case do you think it is? Where do you think the case is falling as of right now? Yeah, I think that they're going through all the evidence right now. And they're, they're, first of all, they're, they're, situating themselves because this is the first day of deliberation. So they're going to pick a four, a four person at this point in time. They're going to right. uh, sift through the jury instructions. Um, but at, that, at, at this point in time, I think they're just organizing themselves. But asking that particular question is interesting because I think that they're also delving into the testimony itself because they want to find out if perhaps Kim Potter was conforming her testimony to uh, defense uh, after the fact. I think that, that they're starting to get into the meat of the evidence at this point as well. Jesse, let me try with you, because Julius doesn't seem to want to doesn't doesn't seem to want to play today in terms of where he thinks the case is. Jesse, where do you think the case is today in terms of uh, how you think this could play out, where you think it will end up? Overall, my opinion, I believe that the prosecution won this case. I think today was a clear example of that. What I found throughout this entire trial was confusion on the part of the defense. Their defense was, okay, it was a mistake, but even if you don't think it was a mistake, she was justified. That is a leap for the jury, a mental leap that I don't think makes a ton of sense. I agree with you, Dan, that even if they were to accept, okay, let's say this was a case where she intended to take out her gun and point it, she wouldn't have been justified. I didn't hear that level of danger. 
by him driving away in the car that that presented a danger to her fellow officers that would have justified the use of deadly force. Now, you mentioned the taser. That is not even on the table. They are not even supposed to consider whether or not she was justified in using a taser because she didn't. She used a gun. So then the idea of a mistake. The prosecution was so keen today in saying, mistake is not a defense here. That's why we have recklessness. That's why we have culpable negligence. Her action was reaching for a weapon on her belt. Whether she took the wrong weapon or not, that's not really what matters here because she, at the end of the day, she took out a gun, she held it for five to six seconds. We all saw what it looked like. It was her perspective to see it, and she pulled that trigger. Now, there's no doubt in my mind she feels terrible about what happened. They might feel sympathetic for her. Maybe there, there'll be a holdout. Maybe there would be a hung jury. But from the law, purely on the law, I believe the prosecution won this day and won this case. I want to play a piece of sound from the defense. This is, uh, this is number four, because the defense was responding to this idea that Dante Wright did not pose a threat. Uh, this is the defense's closing argument from today. No threat by Dante Wright. He broke free from a law enforcement officer and, take to, and took off in his car even after he was shot. No threat. Sympathy for Potter? Well, what are the photos of Dante Wright doing up there with his child? Does that prove anything on this case? Of course not. They're asking for sympathy, not us. Julius Kim, um, what do you make of, of that argument, and how effective do you think the defense's closing was? I think it was pretty effective, because I think that uh, Attorney Gray brought up some good points. In this case, Kim Potter and the other officers were kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, deadly force or lethal force might not have been uh, justified in this particular situation. The question is, is had the, the person had an open warrant out for his arrest, Mr. Wright was trying to escape. And let's say he escaped the scene and went and drove through a parade or did something horrible like that. Now the officers are going to be in trouble for letting someone go. So she tries to do her best. The other officers try to do their best. And I think that Mr. Gray was doing a good job of pointing out that in the course of doing what she should have been doing, she made an honest mistake. She made a justified mistake in the sense of what was going on. I think he also did a good point of pointing out the fact that everything was in real time and that the prosecution was playing everything in slow motion. And it's easy to play armchair quarterback, but in this situation, we have to remember that this was happening bang, bang. It was a very fast situation. And you could clearly tell from the video that she thought she had a taser in her hand. She yelled, taser, 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 and she fired the wrong weapon. And she immediately knew it. And she immediately felt bad about it. I think that all those things go to show you that these officers were trying to do the right thing. Kim Potter was trying to do the right thing. And I think that's going to resonate with, with these jurors, at least some of them. And remember, they have to have a unanimous verdict in order to convict Kim Potter. Let me play one more piece of sound. This is from the um, prosecution. This is number six. This is the question. Everyone seems to agree she's sorry about this. But this is what the prosecution had to say about that. This case is also not about whether the defendant is sorry or whether she's remorseful. Of course she's sorry. Of course she feels bad for what she did. There's no dispute about that. But that has no place in your deliberations. Your duty, members of the jury, is to decide this case without sympathy. And you have an instruction on that. And that's going to be a critical question. What I want to do, though, is I'm going to take a break here. When we come back, there is video that was played during this trial for the first time where we got to see Kim Potter's reaction in the minutes after this happened. And some people are saying, well, it's incriminating because she makes it clear she knows she's going to be in trouble. I'm not so sure. It is a defining moment in this case, and we're going to play it. Come back. Just breathe, just breathe. Are you okay? Just breathe, just breathe. Just breathe. Just breathe. That was Kim Potter's reaction after she shot Dante Wright, and at one point in that video, which I'd hoped we were going to play, she says, I'm going to go to jail. Um, and some have suggested that that is particularly incriminating. But 
Julius Kim, I don't see it that way, right? People who are saying, oh, you know, she knew that she was in trouble. Well, of course, she just fired her weapon. And I think that that actually could engender sympathy with the jury rather than this sort of legalistic way of looking at it, which is to say, oh, well, she, she knew that she was in legal trouble at that moment. She's just clearly freaking out. And I would think that could be helpful. I think you're right, Dan. You have to look at that situation, not with just one sentence or one phrase. You have to look at the entire situation as it was going on. And if you look at the totality of her reaction after she fired the firearm, clearly she didn't realize what she had done at the moment she had done it. And she was shocked and she was in shock. And I think the officers around her were in shock also. We've heard some criticism of the fact that they didn't go and try to pursue him and, and render aid um, but after he had driven away. But you don't see any of the officers doing that. I think everyone was just in shock as to what had happened. And police officers, you know, they're under a lot of criticism, a lot of, a lot of scrutiny, rightfully so many times, but they also are under a lot of pressure as they do their jobs. And they're constantly walking on eggshells now because they know that the public is watching them. They know that everything that they do is being videotaped and they have body cam, et cetera. So I think that officers are more conscious these days that things that they do yeah. are gonna be scrutinized. Look let me play another piece of sound. This is Kim Potter on the witness stand undergoing a cross-examination. This is uh, number eight. And it's part of your job to assist those who are hurt or injured. True? Yes. And to communicate to other officers what you know about a particular scene, right? Yes. Give them whatever information you can to help them do their jobs, to help render assistance, things like that, right? Yes. But you didn't do any of those things on April 11th, did you? No. You stopped doing your job completely. You didn't communicate what happened over the radio, right? No. You didn't make sure any officers knew what you had just done, right? No. You didn't run down the street and try to save Dante Wright's life, did you? No. You didn't check on the other car that had been hit, did you? No. That all happened just down the road from you. Jesse Weber, you mentioned before that you thought that the prosecution was in pretty good shape legally. And I think that cross-examination there is an interesting example, right? Which is, as a, you know, if you read this on paper, you say, oh, well, you know, she's admitting things, they got her, et cetera. And then you watch it. And I think these jurors are going to feel sorry for her. You disagree? I 100% agree with you. There's the sympathy, sympathy vote. They just shouldn't vote that way. The thing that <laughs> strikes me, and if we go back to what we were just looking at, throughout that whole body cam, it was all about her. And that was what was trying to be emphasized by the prosecutor there. It was all about how you're in trouble. Did you really cry because you just shot Dante Wright and he's dead? That's how the jury might look at that video, that she was all about what was going to happen to her and not so much what was going to happen to Wright. And this is the other thing that I think is problematic for the defense as well, is that she didn't take the position that day. I had no choice but to open fire. I had no choice. If I didn't do something, those officers were going to get. That's why I have to say jurors don't always like when something happens and a defense attorney down the line manufactures defense to fit it in there. We saw it in the Maud Arbery case. Oh, all of a sudden it was citizen's arrest, even though no one that day mentioned citizen's arrest. That's going to be a problem for Kim Potter moving forward in this case. Is there the sympathy vote? Sure. Love to be a fly on the wall in the jury room. I, that might cause some sort of disruption, maybe a delay. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if they follow the law, I think they're going to side with the prosecution. All right. We shall see. Julius Kim and Jesse Weber, thank you very much. We are certainly going to be following this as the jury continues its deliberation tomorrow. Coming up with curse words being used more than ever on cable news these days. Would it be so bad to be a little more judicious when it comes to literally calling bull on air? That's coming up. Time now for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. I think we can all agree that the political discourse in the country is coarsened over the past several years. Historians will likely point to anger and maybe some vocal political figures who've ushered in an increased comfort with vulgarities. And I'm not talking about who some of you may think.
I mean, we, we all knew that uh, Senator Manchin couldn't be trusted. Um, you know, the, the excuses that he just made, um, I think, are complete bullshit. Yes, that is Representative Elon Omar calling BS literally on Senator Joe Manchin after he publicly rebuked Biden's Build Back Better plan. And her willingness to be foul-mouthed isn't that rare anymore. A few days ago, here's San Francisco Mayor London Breed's colorful way of calling out criminals in her community. More aggressive with the changes in our policies and less tolerant of all the bull that has destroyed our city. Now, it used to be rare to see an elected official using profanity to publicize policies, but here we are. And not to be outdone, our friend, retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, responded in a similar fashion. I find all of that offensive. This is not anything new, and I fault her if there's bull in her city for not tamping it down sooner. <laughs> Public policy aside, what is up with the increased frequency of swear words on cable news? I'm not saying I'm offended, but I'm surprised at how prevalent it has become. Like when calling out political rivals, or even worse, your cable news enemies, as CNN's Jim Acosta did this weekend. What's even more disgusting is that Fox News host Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, they've been caught red-handed, acting like North Korean state television, lying to their viewers about what happened that day. Guys, you've been busted on your bullshit. Now, I'm guessing they feel the same way about Acosta. And this trend of the troubling talk extends to international affairs. Axios reporter Barack Ravid reported on the bromance between Trump and Netanyahu. Until today, everybody thought they were best friends, no daylight between them. And from now on, it's clear that this was bull We get it. The FCC doesn't regulate cable, so you can technically say anything you want and not get fined. And yeah, okay, using the word BS could put a point on a passionate, angry thought, but maybe we should just use it a bit more judiciously. So let's move on and cut out the bull. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That is our wrap-up of the day's media bias, buzz, and the bull. Coming up, every night I give you my opinion. Now I want you to come on the show and discuss or debate me. Let's talk about one of these hot topics. You ready? Sex in the City star Chris Noth under fire, not just accused of sexual misconduct, but in this case accused of horrifically violent rapes. Are we becoming desensitized because of the way the media covers every sexual harassment allegation as if it's the same? Topic two, the fate of police officer Kim Potter now in the hands of the jury's hand, in the jury's hands. Should she be convicted of manslaughter? I want to hear your argument. And the investigation into January 6th. Does the media cover the January 6th commission too much? Or some are going to say not enough. I'm going to have an opinion on all of this. You can weigh in at newsnationnow.com slash DAL. It's for Dan Abrams Live. Let us know what you want to say, and then hopefully join me on the show this week. Still to come tonight, Donald Trump and Bill O'Reilly's history tour back in the headlines. This time, the former president booed by some of his adoring fans for revealing he got his COVID-19 booster. Bill O'Reilly asked the question. We'll talk to him live. Up next. Donald Trump and Bill O'Reilly wrapped up their four-stop history tour over the weekend with a pair of events in Texas. And during Saturday's show in Houston, the former president did a good thing in his own way. He spoke glowingly about the COVID-19 vaccines and gave them his unqualified endorsement. We got a vaccine done in less than nine months that was supposed to take from five to 12 years. Because of that vaccine, because of that vaccine, millions and millions of people, I think this would have been the Spanish flu of 1917, where up to 100 million people died. This was going to ravage the country far beyond what it is right now. Take credit for it. Take credit for it. It's a great, what we've done is historic. Don't let them take it away. Don't take it away from ourselves. You're playing that, you're playing right into their hands. Okay, so maybe he's looking for a little too much credit rather than just doing the right thing. But kudos to the former president and Bill O'Reilly for promoting the vaccine. It is no secret that Trump voters make up a large percentage of the unvaccinated in the U.S. And if he can help in that effort, in whatever way, 
more power to him. But as the former president soon found out, not everyone in his audience was on board with the pro-vaccine and booster message. Both the president and I are vaxxed, and uh, did you get the booster? Yes. I got it too. Okay, so... Um... Oh, don't, 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 no, no. That's all. It's a very tiny group. Now, it is exceedingly rare for Donald Trump to get booed at all at one of his events. How do we get to this place where it's viewed as condemnable for them to say that they're vaccinated and boosted? Credit to both of them for saying it. It still boggles my mind that there is such contempt for someone taking this life-saving vaccine. Joining us now is Bill O'Reilly. He's the host of No Spin News and just wrapped up that four-city tour with the former president. Bill, thanks for coming back on the program. Appreciate it. So let's get Thank to it. Thank you for having me, Abrams. Let me, uh, let me ask you the question. And this is the question I think so many people are wondering. Was that question pre-planned? Meaning, did you tell the former president you were going to ask it? No. I don't give questions to anybody ever. Um, and uh, to his credit, President Trump doesn't ask me. I think early on, one of his uh, minions came over and go, I, what are you going to ask? And I kind of swatted him on the head. Um, he didn't know that uh, that was going to happen. We did speak about the vaccine before uh, because I think um, what happened in America is a miracle. So we're almost two years into the pandemic. What other country has developed a vaccine? China, Russia, Brazil, New Zealand? No one. Yet in nine months, uh, America was able to do it. And I wanted to know from Donald Trump, this is how the whole conversation started, because it is the history tour. How did you do it? What was the negotiation? And he told us the negotiation was based on a Don Corleone. We'll make you an offer you can't refuse, which he did to the drug companies. You will get billions of dollars if you develop the vax, which they did. And then it got into personal. And, you know, the booze, yeah. there were about 11,000 people uh, in that arena and maybe, I don't know, 100 booed. But you would think that the whole crowd did by reading the corrupt media because they're not interested in telling the truth. But um, President Trump is very proud that his administration developed that vaccine. That's the bottom line. On well, it. look, and, and I think they I, I think they should be. I think they have I think they have a right to be. Um, and I, I think it would be great. Be. It, yeah, I agree. I agree that this is about the country. It's not about an individual person. It's sort of funny sometimes listen to the president make it make it all about himself as opposed to for the country. But hey, as I said before, if he's going to go out there and he's going to promote the vaccine, do it whatever way you want. Get people who are reluctant to go out there and do it. Did you know when you asked the question that he was going to say he's been boosted? No. No, we don't do that. We don't go over that. Uh, he knows that I'm going to ask him about foreign policies, knows I'm going to ask him about deal making. But I don't go uh, in the beginning uh, of the show over anything with him. And that's the beauty and the spontaneity of these uh, shows and why they were so successful. Let me ask you this. So, so there were a lot of questions. We'll get into the numbers question that I know you want to clarify in a moment about how many people showed up. You sent us some pictures, et cetera. We'll go through that. But I think there is, there, it is clear that at certain venues, there were areas that had been closed off. I'm not asking you for the purposes of how many people were there. I'm asking you in terms of the fact that both you and the former president were advocating people getting boosted, uh, getting the vaccine. Was there any discussion when there was available space to open it up and potentially social distance at the event? No. <laughs> Abrams, he... We sold more than 35,000 tickets in four arenas. There's no way you social distance in that kind of a crew. I mean, it was an enormous in success. In, but I'm not, in the I'm not four saying venues. it to put you down. I'm not saying to put it no, down. You I'm really do, not. You couldn't in, do it. The, the, seats, the seats that were not sold. Look, this is my production company. I produced this program, okay? And the seats were not, that were not sold about 90% of them, what they call line of sight seats. You couldn't really see the stage very well. And because the cheapest ticket was like 150 bucks, I'm not charging that money if you can't really see us. It's a small, it's just me and him uh, on the stage. So um, 
we couldn't social distance. Uh, we're in Florida and Texas, which don't have mandates, and people are free to do whatever they want. I should point out that Donald Trump is not for mandates. All right, he does want people right. to be vaccinated, but he's not Look, for and, and forcing them issues. to be. <clears throat> those are two totally right. separate issues, right? And 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 this is why. Yep. Look, the question of mandates is a separate question, for, as far as I'm concerned. I wonder, though, why it takes, for example, the former president being asked by Bill O'Reilly if he's been boosted, rather than him going out there and saying, "Hey, everybody, I'm boosted. Uh, the vaccines are great. It, go out there, do okay, this." And, it, and it, we had to wait until O'Reilly asked him the question. It's my magnetic personality, Abrams, that draws information out of people. Donald Trump understands that 20 percent of Americans are what they call anti-vaxxers. And the reason is fear. In our society, there are two motivating factors, most of all, money and fear in America. And you said the conservative right, they make up a large portion of the anti-vaxxers, which is absolutely accurate. But African-Americans also make up a, a resistance crew. So Donald Trump doesn't want to go out and alienate ever. And this got him in trouble on October 6th, I believe. He doesn't want to go out and alienate his core supporters. And he knows some of them are anti-vaxxers. So rather than making a campaign out of it, and maybe he should have, all right? But he answered my question honestly. He didn't dodge the question, as many politicians do. All right. And I think that all the publicity and I told him that today, he called me and I said, this is good for you. This is good that people see another side of you, not a political side. You told the truth. You believe in the vax. Your administration did it. And you should take credit for it well, because it did well, save, I don't know, hundreds that, of thousands not, of lives. It look, did. Uh, that, there's that's definitely true. But it is he is also making it political as well. Right. I mean, you know, he didn't just sort of Every, view no, it from a sort of... They all do. I mean, come on. Uh, they all, they but, all, look, uh, don't be little they, Bo they, Peep. Every single politician uh, plays to a crew. And they don't want to yeah. tell the crew anything the crew doesn't want to hear. Look, I mean, that's what we talked about this last week on cable news. Yeah. They, they, they're all playing to this. Well, and I'm trying to tell President Trump, run on your record. He's going to run again. Mm -hmm. Right? I said, yeah, yeah, run on your record. Because your record's pretty darn good. I wouldn't have done this show if I didn't think that he had accomplishments. And that's what we try to get out. And before we take a break, because I want to come back and I want to talk to you about some of the crowd size, some of the pictures you sent us, et cetera. You know, you mentioned fear being a reason people aren't getting vaccinated. There are a lot of people out there, and I think there's some truth to it, which is that some of the people on Fox News in particular have been making people reluctant to get the vaccine based on what they've been saying publicly you, in particular. I listen to them way to too the much five. credit. Nobody <clears throat> makes anybody. Nobody makes anybody anything. I did. I did it for more than 20 years. I didn't say make. There are some people on make. Fox News. Yes, you did. Yeah, you I, said I, make. Right. If I said make, I should have said I, I should have said influenced uh, are responsible okay. for potentially look, making look, people look. afraid. This is what nobody understands. And I'm going to make it quite clear. The people who on Fox News who don't like the vax have a perfect right to that opinion. They have a perfect right but, to it. But, OK, well, and I'm going to have a right to it. Is, that doesn't mean it's the right thing right. to do. Wait a minute. If they believe in their heart that the vax, for whatever reason, is not worthy or not good, that's their job to say what they think. Now, really, if I'm so there, facts, facts I'll don't destroy matter, that. everything's opinion on the air. Yeah, I'll, you would. I'll, I'll yeah. counter yeah, that's what I'll do, because that's my opinion, that the vax does save lives. But I don't resent them or want to shut it's them not opinion, up Bill. because they have an opposite opinion. But you know this is an opinion. You just said it yourself, that it saved X number of lives, whatever that number is. That's it's not an opinion. opinion. That it's that sure it saved is. lives, are, the vaccine has saved lives, is an opinion. People. Right, so, so, so it's an opinion Look, the vaccine saved lives. They don't believe lives. that. They believe, they I believe in natural they believe immunity. They're, they're Look, wrong. They're, natural immunity is real, by the way. Well, but I'm not, wait, I'm not, I'm not, we're not talking about natural immunity. I'm talking about, when I say natural immunity, I mean in particular once you get the d disease, et cetera. I'm talking about the fact that the vaccine works. That's a fact. When I say works, okay. it means but it prevents people Abrams, from dying. Abrams, 
right? All right. But they're going to say because they don't like the vaccine for whatever reason, it. and there are a million of them. They're going to say, oh, there's crossovers. Oh, look at the Kansas right. City of Chiefs course, coach. Yeah. He was vaccinated yes. and he got it. So you can't deal with that. All you can deal with as a reporter, which you are, is present the medical science. If the conspiracy people want to go into the ozone layer, they have a right You're to do it. You're saying it's their right but to do it. You're saying it's their right to do it. Right. We have a responsibility. We uh, in the uh, punditry to put forth the strongest argument. And the strongest argument is, as you just said, the vaccine sta saves lives. And that's what President Trump said. That's the strongest uh, argument. Again, yeah. you want to think I'm there were 16 people yeah. that killed JFK? That's your opinion. All right. But it's not yeah. true. That's what we <laughs> do. That, all right. That, but let's take a break here. But I think you are conflating opinion and you're sort of suggesting that anything can be an opinion even if it's not based on any facts as opposed to an uninformed opinion well let's take a break we will come right back with bill o'reilly in a moment back with bill o'reilly who made some news this week with the history tour with former president trump uh bill i know you want to talk numbers you've been vocal that the crowds turned out for your shows you shared this picture to social media from your Saturday event in Houston. It looks full. You also showed a picture from Sunday that looks full in Texas. The Orlando Sentinel still reported last week that just 5,400 people showed up for your date last week in Central Florida. They also talked about significant portions of the upper deck, curtained off, et cetera. Give us uh, what your take is on the turnout in Florida and Texas. Did you have more people in Texas than in Florida? Um, Lauderdale was uh, a big number. Lorlando uh, was a, a laggard, but we had uh, more people than that in the building. Um, and there were line of sight, as I said earlier, that weren't uh, conducive to $150 seats, which was the low. Um, but the press lied about this because they're never going to give Donald Trump credit for anything. And I'll say flat out, there's not a politician on this planet in the middle of a pandemic that could have sold about 35,000 seats at premium prices for four shows. Barack Obama yeah. could not have done it. Hillary Clinton could not have done it. Millard Fillmore could not have done it had he been around. Only how, one. How did, how, Donald how Trump. Did you split the, how did you split the proceeds with him? Oh, I'm not going to tell you that, Abrams. You'd be so jealous. If I told you, I don't want to ruin your week. It's Christmas jealous time. Of you, jealous of you or jealous of, of the former president? <laughs> jealous of the whole thing. It was a humongous financial success. I mean, this isn't the Rolling Stones here. We don't have roadies and, and just two individuals showing up. And, and you can do the math on 35. Do you know what the top was, Abrams? The VIP meet and greet, you know what the top ticket was? Seventy-five hundred dollars, no. and we sold out. What do you get for that? What do you get for seventy-five hundred? What do you get for seventy-five hundred dollars? Come on. I come over to your house and paint your porch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm serious. No. Who's gonna pay seventy-five hundred? What are you, you getting? You're getting a shake the shake the former president's hand. We sold hand. it all. And we you get to done, see Bill O'Reilly in person. Done, well, it, I'm not the star of this thing. Okay, it was <laughs> Donald Trump, but for seventy-five hundred. You get a meet and greet with a photograph and a, a, a chat. You get a bag of good stuff they give you, and you're right up top, and you see us. But I, I'll say it again. Every single VIP ticket sold out um, in lightning speed, right. 7500 right. bucks. Who does that? No one. Bill O'Reilly Bill O'Reilly is a rich man today. Bill O'Reilly, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> Appreciate it. Merry Christmas, <laughs> Abrams. Thanks for having me in. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, bullets fly after a car jumps the curb, sending people just out for a fun night running for their lives as officers try to stop the guy behind the wheel. We're on scene. We'll show you more of this explosive body cam up there. We're on scene tonight with surveillance and body cam from the New York City Police Department. In recently released video, officers patrolling an area of the city where people were being targeted by thieves as they left restaurants and nightclubs, police saw a BMW circling the block, ran a record search, found the license plates were stolen from Mercedes. The driver, Wilson Mendez, then parked the BMW, 
Police blocked the street to try and keep the suspect from driving away. But as officers approached the car, Mendez pulled onto the sidewalk and sped off, rear-ending the car parked in front of him. People standing outside ran to get out of the car's path as police tried to stop it. Officer Corey Titus was in front of the BMW. He fired three shots, hitting the windshield of the car as it raced by him. Police found the car abandoned around the corner with a gun on the passenger side floorboard, had the serial number filed off. Officers found and arrested Mendez. He was taken to the hospital, being treated for minor injuries, and charged with two counts of second degree criminal possession of a weapon. Police continue to investigate. Joining me now, Sean Sticks Larkin, former Tulsa police lieutenant and my former live PD compadre. Sticks, uh, take us through what you saw on that video. You know, these guys were suspects in a series of, I believe, 12 different armed robberies going back to June. Uh, they were a very violent crew that's connected to a criminal street gang there in the Brooklyn area as well. In some of these incidents, uh, victims have been shot. I think there's been two homicides and another person shot. So the unit that's working this case, they've got a group of, uh, of violent serial robbers. And that's why you see them approach the vehicle with actually a total of six officers hoping to have them blocked in. You know, we saw what happened November 21st there in Wisconsin, what a vehicle can do, uh, you know, to a group of pedestrians. And this suspect going down the sidewalk, the pedestrians that were outside here are very, very lucky they were able to get out of the way. As far as the officer because using deadly force, all it takes is a quick pull of that steering wheel towards the left, and that officer is, uh, you know, run over, seriously injured, or even killed himself. I was just going to say real quick that that car becomes a deadly weapon. That's exactly it. You know, I've said it on here before with you. A car is basically a 2,000 pound bullet. And, uh, you know, the officer obviously identified this person as a threat to both himself driving in his direction, as well as the pedestrians that are in the video and even down the road and uh, used reasonable deadly force to try to stop him. Um, the suspect actually crashed into a parked police vehicle at the end of the block and then fled on foot. Sean Larkin, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Welcome back. Always, Dan. And that does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.